Hi. Yeah, we <laughs> Part of the thing. I'll start off by saying, how are you doing? Perfect. Perfect. I'll sing one. <laughs> I, um, I was over to the side because, you know, I, I, like I was watching this beautiful performance and it was on the screen. And it, you know, it's, I, I just can't believe that there are people, you can't hear me that better? Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah. yeah. I really, I really cannot believe that there are people in the city who disagree with what's happening in this work. It just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Right. I just don't, I don't get it. I really don't. And if you're in this room with that energy, I don't move in that energy. So I'm not going to participate with you. Right? This is going to be a day of continuing celebration. I, where, where did he go? Because I want to be the executive director of, the, of celebration. <laughs> Not to preach. The executive director of celebration. I like that. You know, I, I, it's really important. Like, I'm just, I literally standing up here because I'm overwhelmed. Just continuously thinking about, you know, on my Twitter, how many people from San Francisco attack me on the, for the work that I'm doing about loving people. And, and it just blows my mind, man. Like, there's so much love in this, in this community. I, I'm feeling bi coastal. I've been here a lot. So, I don't know. Give me a job, please. Right? <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, it, it's, it just blows my mind. I'm serious, man. It hurts. More than anything, it hurts. It just hurts because if you think of harm reduction, harm reduction came out of the HIV AIDS movement. Right? Specifically in the beginning, gay men were treated worse than ever. And then others had to join and fight with them, which was like the most amazing. It was one of the best times I ever had. It was wild. It, it was, it, sorry, I've been in this work 31 years. I was 12 when I started. <laughs> you know, and I remember those days and what we did as different from what's happening now is like I'm this big butch dude from New York City. Like I was in the mob stuff, right? And, and then I'm with these like uh, my colleague, very effeminate male. And we, all we focused on is what did we have in common? Like, I love you, man. Like, and it's cool. Right, and and that was the beginning of harm reduction. People just loving each other because what was happening to them wasn't okay, and we weren't going to allow that to happen. And suddenly, we started to create this thing called harm reduction, knowing that the harm exists, and what do we do to reduce it? Not to change the person, not to tell them they have to go to treatment or re, or whatever we're calling it today, um, but to but to work with them from where they are, and tell them it's their turn. And whatever they choose to do, we're going to support that, right? You don't get the opportunity. We're going to allow you to dehumanize people that have already been dehumanized. We're working in a process to humanize them, to give them love, and work, work with them from a, a certain place, and we're just not going to allow you anymore. It's got to be over. Those of us doing harm reduction, we just have to say that's it. We're not going to even argue with you about whether this is good work or not. We're just not. It makes no sense. And, 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 and what it felt like, it felt like 1980 something in this room a few minutes ago because of the love you guys brought watching this video. I, I don't, you know, you know I, I keep thinking that I came here to speak and give, and all I've done is got. All I've done is receive. So this Tell me. It's, I, I mean, I'm in, I was upstairs in church. Oh my God. That was the greatest. <laughs> that, was, that was just medicine. So in Native community, we say good medicine. That was free, good, loving medicine. And and so, yeah, I like this cool speech, but I'm not going to do it because I'm stuck on these feelings that I'm getting. I, I will tell you that's something I share all the time because my mom is the greatest woman on the planet. And if it wasn't for my mom, I wouldn't be doing this work the way I do it. Uh, and I, if you heard this, please bear with me. But I'm a kid and I'm going, I always spend time with mom, I was a mama's boy. And mom was a nurse in New York City for 40 years. And she uh, worked in the ER for a while and I would go visit her. And she was working with this guy, basically doing wound care back then. 
And I didn't understand him. I'm like, well, why do you keep helping this guy? He's here every day. Because the school I tell across the street told me to be selfish. And she says, I'm a nurse, and I'm going to treat this guy until he's ready to take care of himself. Mm. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. And what we do in harm reduction is love on people until they're ready to love on themselves. And if you're not ready to do that and participate in that journey, and you think the people that are outside this building on the tender one are too annoying for you to live around, then move. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that I don't argue with you. It's not where I'm coming from. But really, I, I, it blows my mind how people move into neighborhoods and then ask people who were there to leave. Right? Who's right? coming? Who's coming from a First Nations person? We, Lydia and I, had a guy tell me in the Tenderloin that I should leave this country. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm a First Nations person. Indigenous to this land. I'm going nowhere. So, like, I'm really asking us, those of us who care about this movement, those of us who care. You know, harm reduction is love, right? And, and, and those of us who care, like, let's, let's kind of maybe do a shift. Let's not participate in that negativity. It's exhausting and it's unnecessary. And those people need help and love. They should come to the next side of Sunday and spend right. and listen to you yeah. saying that they need that for real. I think you need to have a separate one just for them. Um, because it's it's tiring. It's tiring, right? And 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 so you know, we are working with people who are in pain, people who our participants. Who are out here using drugs are in pain. They're self-medicating traumatic experiences, sexual abuse, physical abuse, all kinds of abuses, and pain or mental health conditions, or all three. You don't get the right, you don't have the right or get the opportunity to get in the way of that. Allow us to do what we want to do. I don't understand still today how San Francisco doesn't have an OBC. Still don't understand it. I don't get it. I'll tell you this, in New York and in this work and harm reduction across the country, we were all sure San Francisco was going to be first, 100%. When I came and spoke to the supervisor, I, I testified with Alex, the amazing Alex Cole, we don't know, learn about him. We, we testified for the supervisors and they, they asked me, like, what do you say to San Francisco? What do they do? And I said, just be San Francisco. And then we need to make a shirt right now, just be San Francisco, make some money, work on that. And what I mean by that, is where did this start? San Francisco's this love fest of taking care of people and truly, and, and like, you have, oh, you have more things? <laughs> then we love you more. <laughs> we have a mental health condition and this? Then I love you more. I think about that in a native community. We call our LGBT folks two-spirited. Oh, that's right. Nothing negative. Two-spirited. So instead of saying you're less than, <laughs> we say you're more than. Right? Move in that energy, please. Please, I ask you to do that. If you disagree, it's cool, but don't, don't talk to me, please. Okay. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really working hard. You know you have to save me last time. I didn't mean, talk about what almost happened. But this big <laughs> tough guy told me I couldn't shut him up. And I had to run away because I knew I could. I had to be very careful and not participate. Um, <laughs> Okay, I should start, right? Go to them. Yeah. See that is nicely like Sam shut up. Yeah. All right. Listen, I suck at this, but I, I'm not used to moderating, but we're gonna make this happen. Um, so perfect, perfect place to start. So these great panelists give you a hug. Yeah. Feel your energy all day. Oh yeah. These great panelists. Um, tell us about your participants, who you're working with, what it's like. Um, uh, you know what I said, right? Let's humanize these folks. Tell us about them. Lydia, you want to start? Sure. Um, do we want to do microphones or can everyone hear me? Hi, they're, on, they're online. I am not sharing one with Lydia. They're online. Oh, <laughs> I'm sharing with me because I'm cold. And it is a cold because I've tested every day. And I'm like, no, the cold still exists. Right. <laughs> I was like, no, that's not, I thought we eradicated cold. <laughs> but no, they still exist. Um, who are we working with? We're working with people I love. 
uh, we're working with people who love us back. And we're working with people who have been through some stuff. You know, I hear a lot of, you know, pull, pull your pants up and put your boots on and get on with it and do this and that. Or, you know, people who have experienced trauma early in life, um, people who continue experiencing trauma because of who they are or what they have or what they don't have, um, don't have all the options that we all have. And there are times where, you know, those people are consistently shunned and pushed out to the margins and told that they should be different, <laughs> you know? And so just to be brief, what we do at the Gubbio Project and what we do as harm reductionists, like Sam said, is that we show up with love, yeah. you know, and acceptance of who you are. People who have experienced chaotic behaviors out on the street come into the Gubbio Project, and within a couple of days, you'll see their behavior shift you know, they relax. Yeah, you can go through your bag 420 times, pull out all your stuff, go through all of it, put it all back in, or maybe not put it all back in if you want to throw something away. We'll help you with that. You know, <laughs> and it sounds like such a small thing, but these are the ways that we begin to have these conversations. What are the barriers to stability? You know, what are your barriers? What is happening in your life? You know, that requires you to numb yourself. You know, so who we're working with is we're working with people. Uh, so at Cameo House, our nonprofit is under the Center on Juvenile and Criminal Justice, whose mission is to have a response to the incarceration as a response to social challenges. And so at Cameo House, we are really set up to be a house long-term for women identified persons with children who can come as an alternative to being incarcerated. What I will add is that incarceration or their justice involvement is just the first identifier. 95% of the women that we serve are women of color. 98% of them have substance use history. 100% of them identify as a survivor of some type of violence, and 100% of them are homeless. Mm -hmm. And so we are trying to create a place that has time, safety, support, dignity, and respect. Wow. Much applied. Um, we're looking after our folks that are primarily outdoors. That are my neighbors, but they don't have an address. Okay. Um, some have some mental health challenges and outright deficiencies. Some are uh, come from the queer community. Some are immigrants. Uh, all different colors, gender expression, sexuality doesn't matter. And many of them are using drugs. And many of them use drugs as a coping skill. And that's all it was. And that coping skill worked great until maybe it stopped working as great and started becoming a challenge. And I only know this because I did the field research. But everybody has the ability to be touched by us <laughs> and looked yeah. after. All we gotta do is go out and work for them. Uh, the races, though, you spoke of some good answers. Um, you know, we're realizing that that um, politicians are now making health decisions, which is very scary. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so I often tell them that you're responsible for the lives we're losing every year, every day. Um, and I'm hoping that shifts 
So for Rebecca and Lydia, the opioid crisis is, is, is a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. How does San Francisco's response align with the public health response and how is it different? <laughs> Well, the public health department has put out a um, very long report on how to address the public health crisis that is um, drug use and overdose in San Francisco, and it has not been enacted. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, what I say is, is this 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 overdose crisis? You know, we talk about the war on people with who use drugs. The war that's been waged is a war of inaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a silent war where we sit by day after day and count the numbers of people who are dying on our streets while we don't act. And I put myself in that number. We can open an OPC tomorrow. Mm -hmm. My board doesn't want to. Mm -hmm. Because politicians are saying that they're going to arrest us. Wow. They're gonna take our money. They're gonna shut down services because we wanna save lives. I mean, shame on me first. Shame on me first. The government don't want that. The government can't win no money. San Francisco's response. Hmm. <laughs> trying to see if I can get an example in my brain. Oh, wait. We had the navigation center oh, that didn't oh. have a good enough look. And it got systematically defunded and shut down. It worked there, right? That's right. When I talk about this issue with people, I say to people, San Francisco's public health response reminds me of a pool of water. Hmm. Have you ever tried to sweep a pool of water away? You take the broom and you push the water and it disperses. And guess what? It comes right on back. And our response to me is a waste of energy and time. And it even translates to the pool being our people. And we are annoyed that the people are there and we don't like the look. And so we try to sweep them away and we're spending all this energy and time. And guess what? People just come right back. DPH, where are you? You do good work. The foundation gets there. We make the plans. DPH did this thing where they did a resolution that a committee signed that said that housing is a public health issue. Are our people inside? Resolutions aren't solutions. They're not. Solutions are about problem solving. Problem solving requires an investment in the community partnerships with people who understand the core issue. That it can't always be a top-down response, you guys. We have to start from the bottom up. Yeah. Uh, that's beautiful. Um, we're here. Uh, so I mentioned earlier where harm reduction sort of gave birth, right? Yeah. And so just for everyone on, on the panel, harm reduction is a term that's thrown around often and people don't understand what it means. Uh, so the question is, you know, can you explain harm reduction and what it looks like on the ground in the work that you're doing with the folks you mentioned earlier? Certainly, and you know, you've heard of don't leave, you know, meet people where they're at and you know, go a step farther, but you know, don't leave them there, see them. If nothing else, see them. You've heard of surge access sites and overdose 
um, information and Narcan distribution and, uh, you know, testing for HIV and STIs and Hep C and all that stuff. But harm reduction also looks like when COVID started, that gray van out there passing out almost a thousand tents since then. Mm. Oh. Probably didn't know that. Mm -hmm. That means going from having snacky stuff to having meals going out there in the van. That means partnering, whether formally or informally, with doctors in the city to go out there. We're not GPH, but we get a doctor or a nurse that can come with us and they can still get wound care out there. Mm. Harm reduction is also taking female urination devices out in the street in a way to clean them. Because trying to think of other ways that people are in situations that are just unbearable. Mm. And nobody should have to live like that. No matter where they are. Have I lost the plot? I think so. Okay. Well, I was, was just so I was overcome. I, I was. It was so powerful. I know. I, I, I'm I, just I, listening, and I got lost. So, what's harm reduction like on the ground? You spoke about it briefly already. Maybe I mean, harm reduction on the ground. You know. For me, like, because I didn't come into this work through harm reduction, I came in this work through absence-based treatment program is where I started this work. Mm -hmm. And what I saw was, you know, a rotation of people coming in and out of the system. And every time they came back feeling more ashamed. You know, part of my job um, at St. Anthony's when I was the head of their safety team was to make sure that the people in the absence treatment program were not affected by the people who were using drugs that were coming in to eat lunch. Mm -hmm. So I would go into the bathroom, put my head over a stall and be like, you're using drugs, you're out of here. I get on the radio and I say, this person is 86 for six months. That sound would echo across the entire foundation mm -hmm. as people march that person out. I, I have deep shame about the harm that I did when I came into this work to love people. And what I did was I stigmatized and I hurt people. When I started to learn a different way, I had a conversation with one of our guests over lunch. And she said to me, Lydia, I thought you always hated me. I mean, to this day, it brings tears to my eyes. It's not what I came to this work to do. And I was like, why would you think that? You know, I seem like I think of myself as a loving person. She said, because I was using drugs in the bathroom and I was so ashamed of myself. I used this program. They saved my life. They give me food. They give me all these things. And I dishonored the space by using in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. No, I'm ashamed. Me, Lydia. Mm -hmm. That this woman, eight years later, who I didn't remember. I didn't remember her. But she remembered me. That's the harm. Yeah. So what harm reduction is, is meeting people with an open heart. Not everybody is ready for treatment. Hello. I sat in a, I sat, I sat in a political sort of group that was talking about, you know, treatment and incarceration in all kinds of ways to get people filtered into treatment. And a question was asked, what do you do if someone is does not want to go to treatment. And the person representing the treatment facility said, who cares about them? Mm. Let's focus on the ones who do. Oh. I care about them. Mm -hmm. So yes, absence-based treatment. Absolutely, mm -hmm. it works for many people. It's a lifesaver for some. But for those people who use and get kicked out of the absence-based treatment programs, housing, and all the other programs that are based on you being perfect. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that they say progress, not perfection. Right, but you have to be perfect or you're going to be kicked out of your housing. Right. Well, after those meetings, I'm so grateful. That's not the way it is in my housing because I need a drink. Uh, <laughs> 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 
I'm so honored to be in this space. I'm also feel deeply honored to serve women who I identify with in that when I was getting ready to come out of prison for the second time, their harm reduction wasn't a thing. There, it wasn't like part of the process. And for myself, it was two years abstinence based or 20 years of prison. So that they said it's a choice, but is it? And then I went and I wasn't able to uh, have a relationship with my children. And so the inexplicable harm, the harm that that caused reverberates through our family till today. Still today, my grown children are harmed by that lack of being able to, you know, for the program to really meet me where I was. And I have to tell you that harm reduction and these beautiful people and the work they do is amazing, but the response for our people out there is punitive. Yeah. Yes. So I'm happy to be creating a space that's in the middle because our women are told they have to come to Cameo or go to prison. But when they arrive there, we meet them with honesty and transparency and the ability to love them and have like tell them that we are not judging them. That our boundaries for our place, that's our problem. It's not them, it's us. And that if they can't fit, if that's not where they are, then we help them get where they need to be. We don't just turn our back and say, I'm sorry that if you're not going to be perfect, you can't stay here. And that looks like warm referrals, warm handoffs, and continued relation relationships because we don't cut people off just because they're not ready to stop using even though in our space, we can't use and drink because we have babies and children living there. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I am trying to create these spaces that are bridging the gap right now between where our folks are meeting people right here and where society and the public and the actual response, what the criminalization is actually happening. Well, yeah, you know, I think of these mandated programs, and it's really a blessing to know that you have someone inside who's, I won't, I won't speak for you, but like saying, okay, bring them in, and we're going to do it this way, and then when they get in, we're going to really support them in the healthiest way possible. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, because many of us want to get rid of these mandated programs. Mm -hmm. There isn't a person in this room who would be offered uh, a, a program for for a short stay or 20 years in prison, who wouldn't choose the program, yeah. right? I wish that was an option when they, they sent me yeah. off uh, uh, in, in jewelry I didn't want to wear. <laughs> but, you know, I want to ask uh, both Rebecca and Sally, uh, what does treatment look like these days, right? What is, it, what is, what is good treatment? If there's, if there's such a thing, what's the most effective treatment for all folks who are using drugs? Specifically here, because I'm really anxious to hear this. Well, let's uh, let me start with some barriers. I wrote them down. I want to not miss any. Criminalization is the first one, and has failed in quote war on drugs, which we know is war on people. And getting back to San Francisco's political landscape and the landscape that's really rampant in this country, politicians love to turn back and go back towards a war on drugs, just like civil war reenactors. Let's replicate this again, and it's going to have the same effect, except for with their failed war on drugs, they're killing repeat real people. They're not reenacting things. More people are dying because of this. The healthcare system, they're still stigmatizing people. It's still putting barriers on people in which to get care. That's 
whether you're using drugs, whether you're homeless, or it doesn't matter. It's doing that to a lot of people. Uh, women, hello, half the population. Language, shaming language is a huge barrier. You know, clean, dirty, but I also have these ones that, you know, recovery is a loaded word for a lot of people. Relapse is a loaded word for a lot of people that when they say it, they instantly direct shame toward themselves. Much of my work, I spend so much time trying to help people reduce their own shame. They're carrying around bags of it and society is putting on more, so they never reduce it. And then they are trained, we're socialized to do it to ourselves. And if, if you're substance involved or anything, you're going to do it more. You're going to become very good at it. Right? I can do me better than you can, right? <laughs> and then that whole absence only belief is a huge barrier. Yeah. Who's to say that what one person's sobriety, however that looks like, recovery, however that looks like, is the same for everybody. Somebody sure. is going to be different. Sure. I know many people who have found a way to manage life and do life just fine. But they had to learn what their coping skill, what their coping skill did, did or did not do. A friend of mine gave me great messaging. If I look at my substances that I like to use as family members, now remember that I've learned to have relationships with my family members over time because sometimes the family in my life, I got to push them away a little bit or bring them closer so I can have the same life. Yeah. And so then I look at my substances like that. Now it doesn't seem so funny. Well, that makes sense. I get to choose that relationship. I get to determine the more or less. And the things that are effective is you got to have equity across the board. If everybody isn't given a fair shot, it's going to show up in negative ways. I don't know, people that are going to a lot. It's already running like that. And include people in their own solution. Well, it's empty. I value you life. You know what? Your organization, I, I love you. Because you know what? You have a pro life organization. Why don't we reimagine that phrase? Thank you. I, I will take a moment to acknowledge the amazing staff at All Point NYC for sure. Uh, yeah, please, 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 please. Um, I am truly blessed to have the team I have back home, the work they do, the way they show up. Um, you know, I, I, I get to do this stuff and, and manage it from, from a, a certain space. But when I walk in those rooms and our OPCs and watch live be saved every day and, and just beautiful, loving people, uh, thank you for acknowledging that. I really appreciate it. Francis? Um, okay, treatment. I love what Felony said. What we do at Cameo House is we try to get off this hamster wheel of trying to like just repeat the same process that we know doesn't work. Um, that that treatment and program is this cookie cutter sort of response, and you can write it out in have a plan, you know, you have this like plan for treatment and you give to every single person. And they're supposed to follow, I guess, what some doctor or what some professional decided was the way to treat yourself mm -hmm. if you're a person who uses drugs. And at Cameo House, instead, what we've done is we flip that whole thing around and we say that the you the person drives their own treatment. Mm -hmm. And so instead of saying, that Felony and Sam and Lydia are going to come into the program and they're all going to get the same treatment plan. We actually meet with each human being, figure out who they are, where they are, what do they need, what would they like to see happen for themselves. And then it's, it's, it's their plan. It's their life. It's their life. And so we're there to support them as they get the things that they need and create a safe space and the time for them to be able to do that. And you know, once we put the power off of us and put it into the person, we have seen 
the success exactly flipped. It has exactly flipped that the, when people are given the power to have the autonomy over their own choice and that it doesn't have to be what I agree with. It only has to be what they are ready to do. And if they're not ready to do that, then we figure out where, what they are and get them to the place where they can get what they need, period. Thank you. You know, it reminds me, uh, thank you for bringing that up. You know, we, we I remember I was doing some work in drug court with uh, some, some of our participants years ago. And the judge kept saying, that, you know, this program, these, the, you've been to multiple programs to work off the dismiss, and it hasn't worked. And, 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 and what we realized was that each program was about don't use or you're failing. Mm -hmm. And so I was kept trying to explain to the DA and the judge why it's not working. And then I said, uh, a little out of line, but I said, judge, what size shoe do you wear? <laughs> and he said, a size 12. And I said, does a size four fit you? <laughs> right? And he said, no. So imagine that every day I give you a size four sh shoe to put on and it doesn't fit you. So imagine you're trying to get someone to heal through a process that worked for somebody or maybe a hundred people years ago that doesn't work today. Sure. People forget this. The first year of programs in New York State, first year of programs, when you were in treatment, after I think a month or so, guess what you got back? The first thing you got, you, they gave you back. Your drinking privileges. That's how old harm reduction is. Imagine that. Then somebody said that doesn't work. Ooh, I still want to meet this person. But that was part of the process. You were primarily back then in the 70s, right? You were a heroin user or New York City, a heroin user, right? And so at a certain part of your process, you look, you earned your drinking privileges back. Yeah. And suddenly it disappeared. Can I add one thing? Because I think that it's important for me just to like identify and throw out in the room. When I say that our women are mandated through the justice system, through the courts, through family court or through federal court or whatever courts, then they come in with these mandates that are coming from the justice team. And what does that look like in program is that we say, the judge has told you that you, if you do, do A or B, that this A or B could happen, that these would be the consequences if you don't do these things. We're not the judge. We're not the police. We're not your parents. But we are here to remind you, hey, if you make this decision, don't forget that the courts have said, if you A or B, this could be the consequence. And it's not done in a mean or harmful way. It's done in a way that's saying, we just want to remind you that that's your obligation with the courts. That's not us, but we want to make sure that you're okay. And we don't tell them. <laughs> if they decide not to do A and B, we don't run to the phone and call and say, and you know, and tattletale and do that either. Um, but it is a place, a cameo, because they come with their own stuff that we are there just to sort of like, remind them, um, but it's still their choice. Thank you. You know, many programs that are uh, structured the way Cameo is, do, does the opposite. They're constantly reminding the participant, the woman in this case, if you do this, you're going back to prison. Like they hang it over their head. That's really wonderful to hear. Holding them hostage. Holding them hostage. Yeah, like professional hostage holders uh, calling it service yeah. or treatment. Um, so for Lydia and, and Felony, how do you define success? And can you share a story of, of your work that you consider success or successful? Yeah, this is always a compli uh, complicated one. You know, success is, is um, in the eye of the beholder, right? But a lot of times it's defined by absence, 
long-term abstinence, um, which is unachievable by the vast majority of people. Um, the way I define success is when somebody feels safer, when someone experiences joy, when people manage to re-engage with community, and when people achieve more stability and health. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a simple definition. No. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell a story that may sound confusing, but I want you to really think about this story. We have a participant who comes into our program who when he, he's experiencing homelessness, he's been on the street for six plus years. He was using meth and alcohol. Um, when he came into our program, he would often behave in a chaotic manner. Um, and it was a lot of coffee. It was a lot of, you know, being in the bathroom, a lot of sort of, you know, roaming around. And eventually he kind of, you know, started chatting with me and kind of started settling down a little bit. Um, comes in almost every day. Um, now he, he likes to sleep in the church. Um, he's actually sleeping. Mm. Right. Um, he feels safe enough to be able to close his eyes mm -hmm. and sleep, um, have a cup of coffee, start conversations. And the other day, I was in my office and I could hear him chatting with one of our other participants while we were doing harm reduction supplies. And one of the other participants and he were talking about um, the, the one, the one, one guest was saying that he no longer used drugs. And this gentleman said that he stopped using meth. And he said, you know, part of it was because when I came here, it was so quiet. It was like I could really hear what the leprechauns were saying to me. <laughs> and they were saying, stop using that. <laughs> right? And I'm listening to this conversation. I'm like, this is, this is, this is insane. And how beautiful, right? Yes. And he's just like, he was like, so now... I'm only drinking beer, but it turns out because I saw a doctor here the other day, I have diabetes, mm -hmm. you know? So I decided to move to White Claw, which is when I left my office and said, no brother, no. White Claw has got way more sugar than, than beer. Like, <laughs> but this is what I'm saying. At no point was this person challenged to change who he was or what he was doing to make himself comfortable. And he is making progression to a more stable life because he has found a place where he feels comfortable. And there is a diversity of people around him. We have seniors who just need a place to be during the day and have a cup of coffee. We have people who are experiencing homelessness. We are people who are marginally housed, who don't have an outdoor space. All of these people develop a community when people are isolated and pushed to the pushed out or pushed into like silos, where it's like, oh, these are all the drug users, these are all the, it it creates an atmosphere where you're just constantly sitting in that same cycle. Creating a safe space for people is not just about supervised consumption. Right. You're right. Right? All of our programs our consumption sites. There is a bathroom in this city that doesn't have people using drugs in it. Okay? And I'm also talking about people's homes. The vast majority of the people using drugs in San Francisco live in homes. In Recon Valley, all over the place, okay? They're snorting cocaine, they're smoking marijuana, they're drinking their cocktails, they're using drugs. Tell the truth. Yeah. Okay, the difference is the reason we want OPC and why it will be successful model is because it's acknowledging that people are using drugs and therefore you can have those difficult conversations about what are you using, why are you using it, how can you use it safer, and what do you need us to give you so that you can have more stability, more safety, and more better life. Um, so two things very quickly. One is, at all point, you know, we have the only two OPCs in the country. 
Uh, we have 32 registered participants in the OPCs. We serve 10,000 people a year. What does that say? Not every person walking in is using the OPC, right? More, a third of the organization is using the OPC, but they're coming in for all the things you just mentioned, except I want to know where you hire leprechauns because <laughs> I'm guessing they come fairly cheap. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, it was about success. Well, yes. one of the things, yeah, I I can only answer how I measure my own success okay. or the things that I have control over. Everybody that I work with, I have to ask them what success is for them because that's what we work for. They're at the center of anything I do is because of what they want or don't want. If I do anything other than that, then it's all about me. And I, I'm not in the wrong. Um, in fact, the best work I do is when I get the heck out of the way. <laughs> you know, they do. People, I don't fix anybody. I don't help anybody. I serve and support. They do their own heavy lifting. It's their life. If things go bad, and sometimes they do, I'm not living it. I've got my own parents. Okay. But about within the first year, uh it started here i was in a program where we had this um participant a little bitty itty bitty thing like 90 pounds and i only say that because i'm so much bigger than they were little bitty thing with a little bitty dog heroin and fentanyl was starting to get around and we had three other people on the team they had al already met the person i knew of the person because i'm always in tenderloin and i'm pretty sure they knew about me but we'd never really met and I heard they were at UCSF up at uh, Parnassus. And then I was to go check in on them. They had a really horrible abscess on their leg. And I was to go check. And I got the, the message that uh, they're probably a little bit dosing. And, uh, you know, in withdrawal state. And I understood that this little person can have a pretty nasty attitude. So I go over to the ER, UCSF Parnassus, and then they let me in. And she's in one of these, it's kind of like a separate room that's all glass on two sides and a curtain. So, uh, you know, kind of knock, knock on, on the glass and peek my head in. And I can tell she's seen, she, she recognized me. And I just, you know, hello, this is my name. And I was told to come and check on you. And she just had a little face and looked at me. I had her little dog too look at me the same way. And so I could tell this is this is just, you know, okay. And you know, I'm just coming in, just invading this room, feels like. And so I just go and I take a seat and I just sit down. I'm not gonna sit there and talk to her. She doesn't want me here, but I'm you know, I'm gonna do a check. I'm gonna be there for a little bit and then I'll go. And but one of the things I do, I'm fairly direct. So after a while, I just, you look like crap. <laughs> Are you hurting? Ooh. I just say it like that. Not in a, I'm not saying it to be mean. I'm saying it in a way that, you know, I've seen it before. You, you know, you look better, even though we've never met. And uh, she, I can see she takes it to heart. And she's pulling back. Um, asked her if she had anything on her. Now she's look at me, looking at me. With skepticism and a little bit of paranoia, you know, and I just felt I'm not a copper, right? And so I reach into my bag and throw my package of fringes at her. And, and I just said, better be quick. And I went up and I blocked the door. Probably not suggested for me to do by <laughs> an employer or anybody else, but at that moment, I'm looking at this abscess, it's huge. And they said they had these two bags go in there and it was gonna take like 10 hours to go in and she'd only been on these bags for um, two of the hours. And if she left early, this treatment doesn't work. It has to run its full course. She takes this nasty abscess with her out to the street. And so she's gonna go out into these extremely nasty conditions and I don't know what happens if you get that on somebody or whatever. I don't know. All I know is it's bad. So I made the decision. It was my decision. Um, got through that. 
um, do the thing I took off. Now, our, the rest of our relationship for the next year and a half required me seeing her a lot out in the streets, out in the Tenderloin, by Civic Center, a lot of walking with this girl, with this woman. Sorry. And many times, anytime she was upset with anything, it was, she had the MFers for me, she had all the names, it was me. Part of my job was to not take it personally, but just take it, let her get it out. We tried so many things repeatedly, and I never pushed. Like, you know, if she wanted to do something, we'd give it a shot. If it failed, and she said it was a failure, no, it just wasn't as successful as you like. I've done way more things poorly than I've done good in my life. Way more. Expert. <laughs> right? Well, here's where she's at now. She got to leave here. She no longer uses heroin or any opioids. She drinks occasionally. She owns her own tattoo shop. Oh and photography. Wow. Reunited with her mother who used to live on the East Coast. She left here. Her mother left the East Coast. They met in Chicago and they're still there. And even on her, I got her on the, um, the bus to go over to Chicago. And on the way over, she gets uh, pulled off the bus and I think it was uh, Utah, and her mom gives me a call. They got her in jail, and what do I do? And I don't know, kill her. <laughs> so I felt really inefficient, and uh, really deficient, I mean. And I just explained to her, here's what I would try. And I just tried some language that I really didn't think was going to work. But she talked to the Utah cops. They put her back on a bus. Yeah. Sent her to Chicago to get reunited with her mom, and it's about three years later now that she's got her own business. You know, I'm paying for the rent. I'm going to pay for it. I'm healthy. I'm happy, but she just needed somebody to not treat her like she's little, not treat her like she's a woman who can't do for herself. Because she was really smart. And the last thing she needed was anybody to make her decisions for her. Uh, a few more quick questions for the panel and then some Q&A. Uh -huh, sort of. Just two quick questions for the panel. Uh, we're here to talk about drug prices broadly, but also specifically to recognize what was Awareness Day and to lift up the memory of lives lost, survivors, and life-saving heroes. How do we best pay homage to those folks? We open an OBC. I mean, enough already, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, what will it take us to get there? Well, Glide could open one tomorrow. Yeah. Tell me. I know. Yeah. Well, how how do we do that? How do we do that with the city? It, it's time for the people. How many people do we need to see die before this happens? Well, that's exactly right. I mean, but the thing is, is that when you have people who are being, have their uh, hands tied behind their back because of their employment or because of their boards or because of the founders or because of the mayor or because of the police yeah. department, you know, it is easy for me to say as a single parent, who really is a single parent, my daughter's father, is also a victim of the war on people who use drugs and is no longer with us. It's it's been proved to be success. Absolutely. But but we're being threatened with we're being threatened with arrest. The important part of the thing about Sam being here is yeah. he is the evidence right. well, yeah. that we will not be arrested. Right? But we need to come together and we need to do it. And anyone who's interested in having that conversation, I'll be here later. Good. Okay. But this is the people who are doing this work are exhausted. Exactly. We're exhausted. And day after day, we have to listen to jackasses mm -hmm. talking about how we're killing people with harm reduction. Right. You know, when we know that that's not true. And I am tired of it. Mm -hmm. I have been doxxed. I have had people talk about, like, you know, my weight. Um, they've called my friend Sam a thug, you know, because... 
I, as a white woman, of course, needs a man of color to protect me, right? Because I'm not the thug. And trust me. <laughs> right? It's disgusting what's happening in this city right now. So if we want to stand up on Overdose Prevention Day and we want to honor people, then shut it down. Shut down the conversation, stand up, and let's do something. I look at this a lot different because I've been waiting in the politics of San Francisco for the past three years. And I say that it's, we have to expand advocacy to organize, organizing and that we have to expand education, not just for people who use drugs, but for the general public on what harm reduction actually is. Because until they are educated on what harm reduction actually is, then drug users are gonna to continue to be stigmatized and as long as that we continue to be stigmatized, then we're not gonna get any public support. And I'm telling you that unfortunately, the lack of response is politically motivated and that money drives everything. Yeah. And so if yeah. the education is not there for us to get our folks who live in San Francisco to support what we're trying to do, we're not going to get the votes. And if we don't get the votes, we're not going to get funding. If we don't have the money, we can't do shit. I agree with both of you. And also a slightly different idea is that you can't butt heads with people that oppose right. us. Mm. Because those ideas, attitudes, and socialization through this country have come through patriarchal means, capitalism, the benefit of very few, okay? They're still regulating women's bodies. Mm. Like they were regulating slave women's bodies <laughs> so they can figure out how to have more slaves when they stop the ships coming back and forth from Africa, okay? Because yeah. there's money in it. Yeah. Still regulating women's bodies. Mm -hmm. I do drag. I'm supposed to be on me number one because I do drag story hour. And I grab is that. It makes no sense. Mm -hmm. So those are the same minds that will hold a position. They won't, they're not going to use logic. So the best way I've found is instead of beating my head, is to find out why. But if, and if somebody gives you the why that's personal why, I can speak to that. I can understand that you lost somebody in your family and there was nobody around and you're sad and, and your pain is real. Acknowledge, validate people. I never have to agree with anyone, but I can still acknowledge, validate and have a conversation. Yeah, I'll say quickly, how many people that we have visit New York City visit our program from San Francisco? 22, 22 people, leaders in this work, because I want to respond to the question about why aren't we opening up? Why we? I think I live here now. But <laughs> why is San Francisco opening an OPC? Um, so if there were people who came with it, who, who liked the evidence, but, but wanted to see it, couldn't believe what it looked like. And when they visited, those folks were blown away by what they saw in person. So bigger than the evidence, uh, the numbers, the lives saved, the people, the, the, the services they're receiving is, is the actual, uh, the love and compassion that happens. Kaylin, Kaylin C is our senior director of programs. And she says the least most interesting thing that happens in the room is the drug use. The community in the room, the love of folks uh, for each other. I remember when we opened and the beginning, we have these big mirrors and these lights. Most of our women who came to use didn't like to, the mirror. They didn't want to look at themselves. They were embarrassed. They didn't like who they were seeing. I see many of those same women putting makeup on in those. Many of those same women loving themselves, looking at themselves in that mirror and that reflection. I mean, it is beautiful what happens in an OBC. I mean, it's mind blowing and loving. And what we know factually, and uh, Alex can give you all those numbers, but we know people use less. We know people get healthier. 
We know they, 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 they participate. Now, we have a number of services we offer at all point, and we are we're about to put out our one year report. We're close to 80%, over 80% of the folks who use the OPC utilize other services in the organization. Active drug users. If you're at 50%, you're blowing the, the ceiling off. We're at almost 80% because we treat them with love and give them the space that's theirs. And then they become a part of the process. And then they participate in more. Well, unfortunately, what many of the naysayers and the people who hate, who, who, who hate what we do want, is they want our people gone. Yeah. That's right. That's really what they want. That's right. Right? And we're not going to allow that. And I like what Fully said. Let's let's stop fighting with them. Yeah. But I think one of the things Lydia keeps touching on, and it's hard for me to talk about it because I'm one of the well, kind of the person who did it, was when people were asking me about opening an OPC and they asked me questions like, What did you do with politicians? And not disrespectfully, but my answer is nothing. Right. What did you do? What was your, who's your attorney? Nobody. What did you, what we decided as an organization was, did we have enough cover to open? Mm -hmm. And I had the mayor, basically. That's it. The mayor and the two precincts where we were going to open. Mm -hmm. That's all I had. And we opened. And the board supported it. And we opened the next day. And the reality is, what we've had is nothing but success and love and an impact on overdoses in one of the largest cities in the country who was impacted by this, by this madness of, of folks dying. Okay. So a lot of it is, you know, I, I think bringing in politicians and participating even more with them is what's making it difficult. Mm -hmm. What, you know, so yes, I, I look at that in that way where you say, how do we then get enough? When, do, when does an organization decide I have enough cover and I'm ready to move forward? And there are many things I can talk about that I wouldn't talk publicly on the inside of how you protect people. The reality in our organization, it's only me and my board. I, I did everything possible to create positions that remove titles where you're called an officer so that you wouldn't be arrested if someone came. The reality is that um, overall, the feds have been very friendly to us. And they would be absolutely out of their minds if they came and shut us down right now. People are, people were saving lives and having a, a major impact on two communities, just two. $30 million reduction in ER use. I mean, I can go on and on. The police department is working with us, thanking us for. for for, for preventing this process they were involved for years. The DAs in, in New York City supporting us and thanking us for reducing the traffic in the courts that was unnecessary, right? Mm -hmm. And on and on and on. So um, I'll ask one last question. No, we're not gonna ask one last question. I'm gonna be quiet. Really there you Wait, go. First of all, let's pop right. it up for our panel. <laughs> And now I'm going to turn it over to you all to ask questions. And I, my team is going to kill me because the plan was that you all were supposed to write them down and then pass them up. But I forgot to tell you that. So what I'm going to do is come around, bring you the mic. And please, the only rule to this game is that it actually has to be a question. Okay. <laughs> so who has the first question? Okay. Oh, yeah, I, I'm not thinking y'all the mic. I'm gonna hold it. Yeah, in case it's not a question. There you go. Did you mention that HIV? That H um during the HIV crisis in San Francisco, the the difference was wealth and resources. We don't have either one of those. We are looking at a historical age of history right now, evolutionary and with tech. Okay, so how do we in San Francisco practice harm reduction correctly when our city does not offer culturally responsive resources with long term peer support, recovery, or support services? There is no warm handoffs. Cameo House is cut all the time. Why? Because it's evidence based practice, warm handoffs, and they create therapeutic alliances. Mm. Everyone else, Health Ray 360, everybody on the street ain't doing it. 
It's all administrative, tough, heavy, nonprofits causing a lot of problems right. in this city. And that's the bottom line. And the ones that are doing the work mm -hmm. and doing it culturally responsive are being shut down. Right. So why does so, it so repeat the question one more time. Beautiful, but just repeat the question. How do we practice harm reduction properly when our city does not offer culturally responsive resources, a long-term peer support recovery, or support system if needed? It takes up to six months to get services in the city. Hello. How, how do we do it? How do we do it, y'all? That's where we both do. Forget, you know, not just politicians on a, a site, but also treatment on demand is supposed to be a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's just talk. We got more than just people that use the service have to talk about it. The people that they love, the people that they know, the service providers, a lot of times in San Francisco don't live here. Mm -hmm. I live right. here and barely, it's all I can do to barely live here. Yeah. You've got to earn a wage to live here. And when you're talking about getting it done right, you need people with empathy, compassion, skill, but you have to pay them to live in this damn city. Uh, right. Because all the people that can vote that work here are in Oakland. So at some point, we've got to make it attractive to do the work here. And it's that's the hardest thing for me. Yeah, I mean, in terms of us not having the resources, we absolutely do have the resources. That is just, it's not, that's not accurate. We have a lot of resources that are going to create a political narrative that is that is pushing people out of San Francisco and making San Francisco into Venice, mm. where all the services will be provided by people who come in from outside. Mm -hmm. And that San Francisco is going to be this Epcot center Arms. of like, you know, it's a beautiful environment, everyone's mm. great, and there's diversity that we can look at, but we don't really have to touch, right? It's, just, it's disgusting. $300,000 was spent on an ad campaign for Fentolife. Mm -hmm. That $300,000 could have funded our program for a full year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the resources are here. The question is, how do we get people to care? And if they don't care, that's where the politicians come in. We need to hold them accountable. Because in the end, you're having people with a lot of money who are who are advocating for um, these kind of false flags yeah. of like we're going to build abstinence villages and we're going to have all the housing be abstinence and we're going to do all this stuff. The problem is that's not going to cure homelessness if when people use drugs they're kicked out because where will they be? On the freeway down the road. The question is coming to you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great panel. Awesome. Authenticity and representation. So in 2018, we had Mayor Breed here with, uh, you know, a, a pop up of what uh, over those prevention site would look like. At that time, the mayor said, we're going to ask for forgiveness. No permission. That's five fucking years ago. Hello. Think about how many people have died since that day. Well over a thousand people have died. Preventable deaths. So what do we, what, how do we hold this mayor accountable with our new change in pact, which is going more on drugs 2.0? Uh, well, we know this intervention works. She herself knows it works. We, how do we, how do we hold those politicians to account for their absolute flagrant disregard for the way some people use drugs? Yeah, this is all optics. And we got to blow that up. Show that the optics said that this, Political landscape here wants us to see is clean sidewalks. We don't want to see people until that message gets out that this mayor doesn't want to be caught seeing people because people of means who are fresh into the city. I come into the city as a rich, rich person walking through the tenderloin. Guess what? I know what I'm going to see. And then I buy something, and I start living here, and I complain about it when I, I seen it when I walked in. What kind of bullshit is that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't want to see that. So I have money and means, and other people in the same building, two more buildings, another neighborhood, another district, and we're going to complain because we got money. 
optics. When they talk about encampment resolution, the mm -hmm. only resolution is the absence of people. Mm -hmm. Roll that message up. Next question. Another question. Hi, my name is Merrick. Um, I uh, am someone who survived overdose, as well as um, the, I have been very privileged to find to not use since March. Um, thank you. Um, I have a question that's interesting. Once I got lived experience, I looked at things differently. Uh, when I worked in the Florida legislature, we were creating uh, CRF central receiving facilities to uh, address the mental health and drug crisis that was affecting Florida, but we were getting a lot of blocks in the legislature as well as not seeing the results that were on the ground. And I wasn't really realizing why. When I got to San Francisco in November, after I fell into addiction in Atlanta, um, when I came here, I really realized what harm reduction was before realizing what it was as a recipient. I came through the flag food line. Um, I was receiving clothes. I was receiving a lot of resources. But one thing that I, that I was privileged to have was that people didn't let me become homeless. People gathered together, all my friends and folks that knew me to at least put me up in a hostel and I've had permanent housing since January. Nice. So my question is, is one thing that I found, you know, I'm not involved really politically here, but I've been noticing is that I think that there's a lot of um, people want people off the streets. People don't want to see it. People don't want to look at it. They just want people to be absent. I don't believe abstinence is for everybody, but I do believe that housing is a human right. What will it take, whether it's a combination through community organizations, um, clearly there's no accountability for money in the government where we're not understanding why their methods aren't working, but the money's going somewhere because they got a lot of money, whether it's from the Johnson and Johnson and Walgreens lawsuit, um, but there's no progress. What will it take for us to be able to get a shelter or housing that's enough beds for folks where it's unconditional, regardless of using or not, to be able to get folks into safe housing where then they can focus with their needs being met? What will that take? I'll just say something quickly for what I found successful in housing, again, this goes back to our response to HIV and AIDS. Um, part of what, there's, this, there's been a setup in housing uh, for people who use drugs, and, I, and I'll tell you what it is. They're, they will, and I'll speak for New York City very quickly. We have huge scatter site housing program. So they would put someone in an apartment building where families are. They would put someone in that building who's actively using drugs with no support, and then obviously this person's gonna have issues and cause issues in the building, get evicted, and they get on a list that they wouldn't be allowed to be housed again okay. for a certain amount of time. Going back to the original scatter site housing in New York City, it was a program. So building uh, with staff 24 hours, there were phases. Phase one, you were in a community room. Phase two, you shared uh, a, a, my share space. And phase three was independence, where you have your own studio or something like that. Then you go into the community and, and you, you, you have the skills and the experience and living on your own, et cetera. And I, I, it's something I want to, I'm glad you asked this because it's something I think we need to really reconsider throughout the country where you have folks who do this work to provide a service within a structure that they can get to that place uh, uh, so that they can be housed in, in the healthiest way possible. Because that's what really worked in the 90s, that kind of structure. And some people went through it quicker than others. You know, some you realize right away they had a program written that said it's going to take eight months. And then that wasn't fair. People started realizing, wait a minute, I can't make you fit that. You were housed years ago. You were independent years ago. You got to a place where you went through it a lot quicker and you went into independent housing. Um, for me, that's the model that needs to happen across this country so that uh, first you need to offer it and then people get to a place where then when they go into the community and they're placed in this housing, they'll be successful. Or they'll, they'll, they'll have more skills and more ability to respond to, to difficult situations because they're never going away. Uh, so that's what I think. I don't know if anybody wants to yeah, respond more to it. Um, just really quickly, I hate to keep repeating myself, but I think that people who vote in vote here and live here um, are, are tired. And they are sort of like they have, remember with COVID, people got really tired of the masks. So people are tired of this, this problem. They see people using drugs as a problem. And even people who have the compassion and feel like they wanna support things that will help support people get off the street, they feel like they voted and they, 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 they got behind policy 
that was supposed to, and they approved like a proxy yeah. funds to address homelessness, and that then it's five years later, and they don't see that the problem is. It. So people are fatigued and they're tired. And what we have to do is that we have to. It is about supporting legislation and uh, supporting showing up and organizing to change sort of policy. And what I mean by that, it's really hard for regular folks to look at. Tomorrow, there is a planning committee meeting at City Hall that is going to talk about funding that's going to come down in four, three years. Because community organizers like, like people that I work with have gone with proposals and ideas to create these you know, supportive environments for folks. And we get told that there's no money. No. So we ask to get the money and then they say, well, maybe you can get the one that's coming in three years. Mm. <laughs> and people are tired. So we have to, it is like more than just being on the ground and more than just having the spaces that are responding to like a bullet wound that we come with these little band-aids all the time, you know? And it's just still, it's just so like big. And so, you know, really have to sort of like organize to really get some policy change. And when you get into the policy and then you get the politicians to give a shit and then they and then the board can support our, you know, push our mayor to make the decisions. And so it's all it's, you know, it's extremely exhausting. I have two, I see two questions, y'all, and then we're, we're, we're going to have to start to wrap it up. We're a little bit over time. Oh, and Eric has a question online. You have a question, and then I'm coming to you. Okay. Good afternoon. I want to ask Rivera how the impact of Governor Abbott's arbitrary sending immigrants to New York impacted the housing situation. Um, it, it really hasn't. Uh, we have different issues than you guys have in New York. In New York, we have a lot of shelter, but the shelter is unsafe. And mm -hmm. so we haven't really seen an impact in, in the street or anything like that. Uh, in a sense, I'm going to say this, uh, New Yorkers respond differently to immigrants, and we have so many immigrants. Mm -hmm. We're still very strong on the immigrant side. Like, we, we own the fact uh, that, that we love our immigrants and, and folks who come in. Um, as an indigenous person, it always blows my mind when people tell other people to leave this, to leave this country. It makes no sense to me uh, because then you should be first and then we can start over. Um, and, and I also add that, that you know, it, it's just my, it, my, it blows my mind of how people now want to close borders and things like that. But if they go in their own history, they wouldn't be here either if, if that was the option uh, a years back. But yeah, just a short answer. I have it. I have it. I'll speak to myself. Seen an impact. Um, you know, there was quick response right away. I was blown away by the mayor's response to do everything possible to house people. Um, but again, we have a lot of shelter, and and uh, but that's not necessarily the best answer because they, you know, the goal is to get people housed in the healthiest way. Uh, but yeah, we haven't had a major impact, especially in our work. We haven't seen impact at all because I, I remember people saying, oh, they're sending all these drug users and all that. We have seen a, a, an uptick in any of that. So, Okay, one last question. My name is David James, good from Grand Rapids. I've been in New York, you got nice and powerful people. So very nice, you know, from Grand Rapids, especially when I really thought that, you know, you know, you do there, and they want to be more like good people. Anyway, uh, how do you see the future? I mean, you women as race, color, and gender. I mean, you put yourself in the, I think you should be some old bracket. I mean, the peace or the harmony, and you know, get the, the issue of, um, you know, handled, and et cetera. It's acceptable to be happy and nice. You got kids, and you can be married, you got your husband, and it's a wife and kids. And, all this money, I mean, it's all loop all round and round. I want to be happy and be peaceful, but it's a home. You, you know, want to know how they see yeah. the future? Yes, yes. Okay. How do you all see Sick the future? Love that question. Beautiful Please. question to end that. How do you all see the future? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. We're probably tapping into Puerto Rico. I'm probably on a male. I don't know what you mean. We're going with this. Yeah, all this money is just a loop all Yeah. yeah. We only get it to the How do we see the future? Yeah. Yes. So let me just say that I feel like I've been a little angry today. 
the wide mill. So I'm gonna I'm gonna back it up a little yeah. bit. I'm gonna say that I yeah. What I hope for for the future yes. is that is that we have the ability to have a really loving society. Yeah. If all of us can sit in the sanctuary today and celebrate and sing and lift each other up and care about each other, it's all there. That's what we all want, right? Maybe. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, where you come from. What we all want is we want to be seen. We want to be cared about. We want to be loved. We want to be held. You know, these are the things that we want in our lives. So I feel like I hope for the future rather than where I think the future may be going. My big hope for the future is for, to quote the folks at St. John's that, that houses the Gubbio project, is more love. Anyone else want to add on? Oh, I, I just want to say, is you going to ask another Sorry. question? No, go ahead. Because I want to say something very clearly because it's been, yeah, there's been all this stuff about money and things like that. The opioid settlement funds are non tax levy dollars that are supposed to be used, that are earmarked to be used for folks who use opioids oh, well. and to serve them in the best way possible. Major lawsuit in this country. Oh. So, again, if your politicians are telling you they're not allowed to use that money for certain things, that's a decision they're making. These are non-tax levy dollars. In other words, the threat that the feds are going to come in, shut down your program, and shut down your government. We heard in New York State, their fear was that the feds will come, the feds will stop funding New York City and New York yes, State. Oh, and that's actually common. Right? They cannot. These are non tax levy lawsuit money that, that is supposed to be used specifically for open revenue. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge all of our folks on Zoom. Everybody, wait at the folks on Zoom. They've been with us all day. Thank you all so much for being with us on Zoom. And we're going to ask the one question from the folks on Zoom, and it's for Sam. So, Sam, what is your last piece of advice for us in San Francisco? to be able to replicate and implement the model that you spoke so eloquently about in NYC. What do we need to do? Give it to us, my brother. Um, I'm going to say what I always say, but I'll try to add. Be San Francisco. I mean, I'm serious. I need that shirt. I need to make that shirt. Um, what's the advice? Get out your own way. Like, literally, you know, I think when I started this, I mean, it's been a very emotional day in a very loving way. You know, spending time up, upstairs, upstairs, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I've been there all day. Um, spending time up, upstairs and feeling that beautiful energy in the room. Yeah. Uh, you know, there is a there is the opportunity now, especially with what I just mentioned regarding the opioid settlement fund, the separate dollars. Take a chance. Use that money. Open a few. Open a few. Not one. Open a few OBCs in the city. And 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 have it and have it for a year or two and see what happens. Right? With money you are not expecting, with money you cannot use for anything else necessarily. Don't put it in treat. Please don't put it in treat. They have plenty of money. Uh, so I say, step way back. Meet with the harm reduction organizations in the city. There is a model written. There's been a process. You guys have come and visit our site. We're ready to provide technical assistance tomorrow. Um, by the way, you probably realize I like coming to San Francisco. Yeah. Where my team and I are ready. Just say, just say when it will be here. So, wow. so the opportunity <laughs> exists. It really, truly exists because what needs to happen is effort, ability, money, and it is all present right now. We've never had a better time or situation, and we've never had a more a more urgent time or situation to open OPCs here. It's that simple. And for those of you who don't agree, just move over. We don't even we don't want to throw you out yet. Yeah. But, but move over. Let us do what we're doing. I guarantee you the impact will blow your mind. It will absolutely blow your mind. And and yeah, I, I'll end. I'll end. Um, unfortunately, our time is up. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. 
this is really just the start of a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Really thank you for coming out. Please don't leave yet because Ian, uh, our community engagement manager, has a few things to tell you all. But please let's thank our panelists one more time. Well, and Amy, and Rebecca, and Lydia, amazing, critical conversation, powerful words, wisdom, and hope from San Francisco. Thank you all so much. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much. Uh, so my name is Ian. I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at Glide, and I heard a lot of y'all asking what we can do about this and how we can get to the future that we want. And so there's a lot of different things that we have to do, but there's two really easy things that you can do today and this week. So the first thing that we want you to do, everybody should have gotten one of these little cards. It gives you three things that you can do today to make your voice heard and bring us closer to a safe San Francisco. So we've got email your elected officials, share our posts on social media, and call your supervisor. And you can do that. Everyone should do that before you leave. We keep track of how many emails get sent. If you don't do it, we'll know. So just do it before you leave. And then the other thing we've got happening next week, there's a march on Thursday in front of City Hall at noon, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.